Hi, everyone. Uh, so Britt and I worked on this paper recently, and uh, we're trying to figure out basically whether psychedelics, uh, and specifically psychedelic experiences, can tell us uh, something about perception, because um, the idea is that aberrant behavior a lot of the times can tell us a lot about normal functioning. So we're going to basically try to do a quick presentation where we go uh, through the introduction, a quick introduction about what we're going to be talking about. Then we're talking about um, what we think is involved in psychedelic effects and specifically talk about attention. And then we're going to talk about a theory that's um, uh, proposed in terms of uh, as a solution to what is the processing that's going on when we are having psychedelic experiences. And lastly, we're going to propose an alternative that it's a just theory of perception that we're going to call it. And so, Apologies about the slides. Uh, something happened recently and now it's looking a little weird. But uh, uh, basically, basically um, what we know is that naturally occurring psychedelic substances have been used for a long time and uh, mostly by indigenous populations in uh, the Americas. And the primary purpose of that uh, has been ceremonial purposes. And so the most common naturally occurring psychedelics have been uh, mushrooms uh, that are often called ma magic mushrooms or sacred mushrooms, uh, uh, peyote cactuses um, and um, uh, DMT uh, that all of those are found in basically uh, plants, trees and plants. And uh, in addition to these naturally occurring psychedelics, we also have uh, synthetic psychedelic drugs. And the most uh, well-known of those is LSD. And here in the images, I just tried to put those there so that you have a visual image. And so the uh, LSD uh, was basically uh, discovered accidentally in uh, 1938 by uh, the Swiss chemist, uh, Albert Hoffman. And Hoffman was, uh, uh, in search of a novel anal uh, analeptic, uh, which is basically a drug that stimulates the nervous system. And he ended up accidentally synthesizing LSD. Um, and he was also the same person to uh, first isolate the main active ingredient in uh, magic mushrooms when a friend of his gave him a bunch of mushrooms uh, to try and um, uh, experiment with them and basically figure out what's the ingredient in it. And uh, we now know it's uh, psilocybin. And so that happened in the 1950s. And what's interesting about these experiences is that they're very similar to each other. Uh, so here on the slide, we have a, a quote from Hoffman when he uh, initially um, ingested LSD accidentally. And then when he realized that it gave him some interesting visual experiences, he organized, he, he uh, did a, a, a study on purpose. And uh, so basically this is what he wrote about his experience. He says, last Friday, April 16, 1943, I was forced to stop my work in the laboratory in the middle of the afternoon and go home. As I was sized by a peculiar restlessness associated with the sensation of mild dizziness. Uh, on arriving home, I lay down and sunk into a kind of drunkenness, which was not unpleasant and which was characterized by extreme activity of imagination. As I lay in a dazed condition with my eyes closed, I experienced daylight as disagreeably bright. There surged upon me an uninterrupted stream of fantastic images of extraordinary plasticity and vividness and accompanied by an intense kaleidoscopic like play of colors. This condition gradually passed off after about two hours. So uh, these sorts of experiences, especially the kaleidoscopic images that he's describing, the vividness of colors, the plasticity of the images, these are very common both with LSD and the um, uh, naturally occurring uh, psychedelic substances. And uh, just to give you an example, when uh, Hoffman discovered uh, psilocybin, uh, when he ingested actually 32 dried mushrooms, which we now know it's a lot of mushrooms to ingest in one sitting. And so he went on a six hour trip, psychedelic trip. And from that, he wrote that, uh, uh, and I quote, uh, at the peak of the intoxication, about one and a half hours after ingestion of the mushrooms, the rush of interior pictures, mostly abstract motifs, rapidly changing in shape and color, uh, reached uh, such an alarming degree that I feared that I would be torn into a whirlpool of form and color and would dissolve. And so 
a lot of these sorts of um, experiences that have been very common with a lot of these uh, natural, uh, naturally occurring psychedelics and the synthetic psychedelics like LSD. And this is just a, a quick uh, summary of how close these experiences are. So the visual distortion, especially elicited by um, mescaline and DMT uh, are also very similar to the effects that Hoffman is describing uh, when he's experimenting with LSD and psilocybin. And they typically involve uh, the same sort of images, including bright colors, uh, kaleidoscopic images, fast changing geometric shapes that give the appearance of uh, breathing. And I have a video here about breathing that uh, I'll explain in a second, uh, melting or bleeding objects, etc. And so uh, a lot of these experiences, after Britt and I wrote the paper, we found out that um, uh, there's actually a subjective effects index out there that's a set of articles designed to serve as a comprehensive catalog and reference uh, for the range of subjective experiences that uh, may occur, occur under the influence of psychedelic uh, substances. And a lot of these things that we uh, described in the paper and here uh, basically are some of the most common ones. And so the visual distortion, so the images here show a little bit of distortion. Obviously, these are not um, images that are actual, but uh, simulations of images that uh, come close to these visual distortions that people have under the influence of psychedelics. And the colors tend to be very bright. The images tend to be kaleidoscopic. This idea of uh, drifting seems to occur quite a bit. Uh, and it involves an experience of the texture, shape, or structure of an object and scenery that appears progressively warped, melted, or formed across themselves. And so I have a, um, a little video here that shows, oops, sorry, uh, that shows that. So if you, um, uh, as, as you're looking at the image, it basically appears as if the image is breathing. So I keep playing the video to give you a little longer uh, time to look. So, um, uh, so basically the idea here is that uh, although the uh, visual experiences that are elicited uh, by um, uh, the psychedelic drugs are tend to be atypical. In other words, they don't look a lot like these experiences are not very similar to the regular visual experiences that we have of the world. Uh, the scientific community has long recognized that these kinds of aberrant cases often provide a window into the nature of uh, scientific phenomena. And this is also the case with vision. And so the idea is that the psychedelic experiences can help us to better understand perceptual processing of sensory inputs, even though they're atypical, if, if, if not because they're atypical, so they can give us a window to uh, normal sensory processing. And so uh, an increasingly common way to explain these phenomena has uh, been to appeal to predictive processing. And so uh, the uh, image here on the left uh, basically illustrates a hierarchical top-down and bottom-up interaction between predicting and receiving error signals. And so the sensory inputs that the visual system receives uh, on this image is basically give you, is giving you these kinds of um, uh, process uh, that takes place in the predictive processing. And so the main idea here is that the predictions can be true uh, by getting the world right. And so um, a lot of uh, theorists recently have uh, argued that uh, predict predict predictive processing um, uh, can actually tell us a lot about psychedelics. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about why that's the case and what the theory actually says and who's advocating this idea. But ultimately we want to argue that predictive processing is not the best way to explain these phenomena. And we want to propose an alternative that I uh, suggested we call uh, just uh, theory of perception. And so basically uh, before we get to predictive processing, a few things about psychedelic effects and their relation to attention because they're going to become uh, important when we're thinking about pred predictive processing. And so uh, some things to note is that the similarities uh, among the visual experiences elicited by all these halluc hallucinogens uh, suggest that they may share some underlying mechanisms. So there's an argument to be made about whether 
uh, the experiences are the same or the phenomenology is the same, but um, uh, we're going to assume here that the phenomenology is very similar, especially because the, it's described in the literature as being similar. Uh, so uh, we'll start with that assumption and uh, specifically psilocybin is uh, the one that we're going to focus on the most because most of the studies have been done on psilocybin, which is an active ingredient in uh, uh, magic mushrooms, psilocybin mushrooms. And when it's ingested, it metabolizes to psilocin, uh, which shares its core, chem core chemical structure with serotonin. And that's important because uh, psilocin functions um, almost exclusively as a serotonin agonist. And that means that it binds to the serotonin receptors and stimulates, simulates the activity uh, typically uh, produced by serotonin. And so, uh, the psychedelic effects of uh, psilocybin are directly correlated with the binding of uh, psilocin uh, to serotonin uh, uh, 2A, which is one of the serotonin receptors. Uh, and that's located on layer five of the pyramidal uh, neurons in uh, the primary visual cortex. And the image on uh, the top uh, uh, shows basically where these uh, uh, neurons are located. And uh, they're also going to... The, uh, interneurons are also going to become relevant here. So uh, psilocin ha has some affinity for all the serotonin uh, one and two receptor subtypes uh, with the greatest affinity for the 1A receptors in the Rafi nuclei, which is uh, listed on the bottom image at the very bottom there next to the stem. Uh, and the primary location in the brain for the production of the serotonin is that the Rafi nu nuclei. Uh, but uh, psilocin uh, occupancy of serotonin 1A receptors in the Rafi nuclei inhibits the release of serotonin. And that results in a systemic decrease of the brain serotonin levels. And we know that from studies that have been done. And so the underlying mechanisms of psilocybin uh, induced uh, visual distortions um, are not entirely known because we don't really understand how the serotonin biting um, uh, is uh, giving those results or whether it is what it is giving those results the or effects but we do know that the current evidence seems to support the hypothesis that these effects occur primarily as a result of the modulation of the brain's attentional mechanisms and so in a neurotypical brain a brain that doesn't is not affected by the psychedelic uh, substances attention can alter neural activity by modulating signal transmission local cortical excitability or attentional gating and uh, I, I put some uh, images here. These are not images that we use in the paper. I couldn't really find the images from the papers that we're um, uh, citing, but I just wanted to give a little uh, visual of um, uh, what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, attention networks. And so uh, the enhanced signal transmission involved in large scale uh, selective synchronization of neural activity between task relevant areas uh, leading to large scale tuning for or selection of attended stimuli is what we're interested in here. And the increased local cortical excitability raises the levels of excitatory neurotransmitters and neural firing rates, uh, which leads to the shrinking and orienting the neurons receptive fields towards attended stimuli. So attention plays an important role in what were, what stimuli become prevalent or um, uh, important. And so the attentional gating involves the inhibition of the neural activity in the central thalamus, which is basically the switchboard of the brain. So all the information goes there and then it's distributed around the uh, various networks. The visual signals are projected back to the thalamus via inhibitory interneurons, which are also listed on the image on the top. Um, and the, these neuron, interneurons signal to the thalamus to attenuate random noise and neural activity elicited by unattended stimuli. Uh, and this attended attentional gating mechanism in the thalamus uh, regulates the allocation of attentional resources by filtering out irrelevant or random activity uh, from the visual signals that the thalamus sends back to the visual cortex for further processing. So the, the idea here is that we get a lot of information. And so some of this information is relevant and some that information is irrelevant. And so these mechanisms are trying to basically figure out which uh, information is uh, irrelevant or random and which information is not. And so 
the uh, that's done through this activity that I just or process that I described. And so uh, the uh, psilocin binding of the primary visual cortex V1 uh, disrupts exogenous attentional mechanisms. Uh, whereas its binding in the prefrontal um, uh, cortex disrupts endogenous uh, attentional mechanisms. So the, uh, the, both of the attentional mechanisms seems to be, seem to be affected. And so the endogenous uh, attention is often called top-down. And so that's why I put an arrow, uh, an image at the top there. Uh, and that's basically involves the subject control selective or uh, uh, distributed attention to spatial locations, objects, or features anywhere in the scene, basically. And so, for example, uh, endogenous uh, attention involves situations where when you turn your head to look at your alarm clock, you selectively orient your attention to the alarm clock and everything else becomes irrelevant. Uh, with the exogenous uh, attention, that is often called bottom-up uh, attention. And here it's, uh, it involves automatic attention orienting to salient stimuli or exogenous cues, cues that come from outside of you as opposed to your head. And so, for example, threatening stimuli typically capture exogenous attention. So if you see something that, uh, you, uh, that scares you, uh, you tend to automatically orient your attention to that, whether you like it or not. Uh, if someone calls your name in a very busy restaurant, even though there's a lot of noise in the restaurant, you tend to pick up your name because, again, you don't really choose to do that, but it's an automatic reaction. And so... The visual distortions elicited in, uh, by uh, uh, high doses of psilocybin result primarily from the binding of psilocin to serotonin 2A receptors in the la layer five of pyramidal neurons in, that, uh, in the primary visual cortex, V1. And I posted a little picture up here of what the serotonin uh, neurons look like. And so the, the activation of the serotonin uh, 2A receptors elicit both excitatory, excitation and inhibition. And so these uh, receptors uh, activation increases local levels of glutamate, and that's the brain's main excitatory neurotransmitter. And that results in a hyper excitation of local cortical neurons in uh, V1, the primary visual cortex. And so the hyperexcitation of that cortex may explain why uh, subjects who have ingested psilocybin uh, commonly report colors becoming uh, phosphorescent in intensity, which is consistent with findings indicated that psilocybin increases signal amplitude. Uh, and that basically has to do with the physical world of intensity, how intense an image becomes in the primary visual cortex during visual imagery. So what we see with psychedelics, basically we also see with visual imagery. And the idea is that if one of uh, uh, the same explanations should be in principle applied to both cases. And so uh, we know that elevated levels of glutamate in uh, V1 also activate interneurons that connect V1 with the thalamus. And again, the image here with the interneurons are the little red dots uh, where the arrow points to. And the evidence also suggests that uh, psilocin can activate these interneurons directly. So the activation of interneurons leads to an increased release of GABA, which is the brain's main uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter into the thalamus. Uh, so once uh, basically these interneurons are activated, then the, the, we get an increase of GABA in the thalamus. And so the increase, um, the increased release of GABA disrupts the attentional gating mechanisms in the thalamus is the suggestion. And I put an image here that's not representative of what we're talking about in the paper, but just to give an idea of what a noise signal will look like versus the actual signal the minus the noise. And so the blue line is supposed to be the signal plus the noise, which is a lot bigger and more, uh, uh, it contains a lot of unnecessary information and in the regular signal. So it's from a different paper that we haven't cited in the paper, but just to give you a visual again. Uh, so disruption of the gating mechanisms reduces the ability of the thalamus to detect and filter out irrelevant and random noise from the visual signal uh, before forwarding it to the visual cortex for uh, further processing. And so when psilocin is present, incoming visual signals contain a great deal of uh, undetectable noise. 
And the visual system treats the noise signals as it would ordinarily treat high uh, precision signals as it attempts to make sense of highly noise, noisy or low precision signals. Uh, so uh, psilocin also binds to serotonin um, uh, 2A receptors, as we said, in that same layer five pyramidal cells in the brain's prefrontal cortex. And uh, uh, this is uh, even more densely populated, populated with this uh, receptor subtype. So by comparison to V1, the prefrontal cortex is far more populated. And so direct binding of psilocin to the interneurons linking the prefrontal cortex with the thalamus coupled with excessive glutamate levels in the brain's prefrontal cortex increases the release of GABA into the thalamus. And so GABA subsequently inhibits activity in the thalamus, which increases the inflow of information to the prefrontal cortex. And so there's a connection between what's happening in the visual cortex and what's happening in the prefrontal cortex. And that connection um, is uh, mediated by the thalamus and by um, uh, GABA and all these excitations that take place. Uh, so uh, what fMRI studies uh, seem to show is that uh, decreases in the uh, cerebral uh, blood flow and the blood oxygenation level uh, depend, um, uh, sorry, the blood oxygenation level uh, dependent imaging signal uh, in the thalamus support the hypothesis that uh, psilocin binding in the prefrontal cortex has an inhibitory effect on the thalamus. And the detection of decreased blood flow and deoxygenated blood in the thalamus demonstrates that psilocin inhibits the thalamus ability to tune for attentional stimuli. So normally without the um, uh, uh, psychedelic uh, dose, the thalamus would be tuning the uh, attended stimuli, but uh, uh, because of uh, uh, the substance inhibits that, the thalamus is not doing the work that it would have been doing otherwise. And so the studies from fMRI and MEG uh, also linked uh, psilocin binding uh, at the serotonin 2A receptor in the prefrontal cortex uh, to uh, desynchronous uh, default cortical activity and network uh, disintegration. This is uh, work that's been done by Carhart and Harris, and they've been doing a lot of work on how uh, psilocin uh, affects the prefrontal cortex. And so as in the visual cortex, psilocin activity in the prefrontal cortex also increases the release of glutamate, causing transient local hyperexcitation. So we know all of these things about both the prefrontal cortex and the um, uh, 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 primary visual cortex. Uh, the, the activities uh, uh, tend to be similar. So the desynchronous default cortical activity, local hyperexcitation, and an increased inflow of sensory information from the thalamus seems to compromise uh, its capacity to constrain thought process and prevents an overly explorative or unconstrained mode of thinking. So typically the um, uh, primary, uh, uh, the prefrontal cortex is uh, responsible for thinking and so presumably when we see things in normal vision, uh, our, primary, our prefrontal cortex injects some reason into it. And so we read stimuli differently, but once psilocybin comes into the mix and it inhibits the capacity of the uh, prefrontal cortex to do that job, then the visual cortex, uh, the information that the visual cortex gets tends to be more vivid. And so that's what we see when we have experiences of psychedelics. And so this uh, is the main reasons, or at least that's what the study suggests, that psychedelic experiences tend to be described as mystical or transcendent because you no longer have the ability to think rationally in the way that you think uh, in, uh, when you're not under the influence. And so the temporary lifting of this normal constraint of thinking can trigger non-linear thought processes and increased or more distant associations. So normally you wouldn't be thinking in the way that you're thinking, um, uh, you wouldn't be connecting things that don't seem to be connected to each other. But once the psilocin comes in to the mix, uh, you make associations that you wouldn't have made otherwise, or your thought process is not uh, uh, working in a linear way, but it's just going all over the place. And so it's more uh, unpredictable in that kind of way. <laughs> 
So in the second section uh, in the paper, we describe the one of the explanation that um, uh, has been provided, especially by Carthart and uh, Harris, who's been doing a lot of this work on uh, the effects of psilocybin uh, and psilocin on uh, the prefrontal cortex. And so an increasingly common way to account for these uh, ordinary visual perceptions that uh, we've been talking about is to appeal to predictive, pre predictive uh, processing. And so researchers uh, have suggested that predictive processing uh, can provide a model of the brain mechanisms that accounts for altered visual experiences caused by psychedelic drugs, including psilocybin, uh, because uh, presumably if it can account for ordinary visual perception, it can also account for the uh, uh, atypical visual perceptions that we have under the influence of uh, psychedelic drugs. And uh, according to the predictive uh, processing framework, uh, the generative models uh, at different levels of processing yield predictions or perceptual hypotheses about the distal cause of the sensory signal that are assigned different Bayesian probabilities in accordance with uh, Bay Bayes' uh, uh, theorem. And I put the, a bit of a image there to just uh, give an idea of how this is sort of happening. You receive the information and then you assign uh, probabilities to uh, this hypothesis given that information. And then you account for uh, prediction error. And then you uh, take into account uh, uh, the prior information, you make inferences and so on. And so in Bayes' theorem, uh, which I also posted in the, on the slide here, um, e is the incoming visual signal, H is the hypothesis that we make in, in, on the basis of it, uh, or the prediction about the distal object, the object that's out there, what is it that we're perceiving? And so uh, the probability of uh, age is the prior uh, probability of that hypothesis before the system receives that signal E. And uh, the conditional hypothesis is the uh, likelihood, the probability of receiving a signal E given that hypothesis. And um, the posterior uh, is the probability of that hypothesis giving E uh, and the probability of that uh, uh, experience uh, or the incoming uh, visual signal uh, that is uh, the normalizing and, and we, uh, calculate those with a normalizing constant um, because that needs to be done for the calculations to yield the right results. Um, so the model generated predictions are then sent down the hierarchy where they're uh, compared to incoming sensory signals and that yields a prediction uh, error signal. So uh, because predictions suppress congruent incoming sensory signals, the prediction error signals only convey information about the unexplained components of the sensory signal, which is then used to generate better predictions. So this process continues until the system converges on the coherent or a good enough perceptual representation of the distal cause of the sensory signals uh, very quickly after the, you are exposed to the stimulus, about 200 to 600 milliseconds. And so, so this process on the slide there is supposed to show that this process goes on and on and on. Uh, and eventually um, you get uh, uh, the results. And so uh, you, you, may, uh, you, you determine what you're experiencing or your uh, uh, mechanisms, brain mechanisms determines what the stimulus is. And so not all prediction errors are given the same weight in the uh, uh, revision of predictions. Um, or the models that generate them. And how much weight is assigned to a prediction error signal will depend on how precise the signal is predicted to be. So when we have cases of high prediction signals, that tends to be far more reliable uh, than cases of low prediction signals. So if the visual conditions are very low and you can't really make out what uh, is out there, that's going to involve low precision signals. And so, um, that's going to be less reliable than if you have uh, adequate lights, uh, uh, adequate lighting conditions where you can actually see the signal better. And so if a prediction error signal is predicted to be highly precise, then the prediction error encoded by the signal contributes significantly to the revision of the prediction. But if the signal is predicted to have low precision, then the signal is attenuated and the encoded prediction error doesn't lead to a revision of the prediction. Again, in the image there, you go back and forth. 
And so the upshot of this is that the predictive processing framework um, basically says that the brain doesn't just try to predict the hidden causes of the sensory signals. It also tries to predict the precision of these signals. And so like expected causes, uh, expected precisions uh, are based on statistical irregularities extracted from past experiences. That's how the Bayesian um, probabilities are uh, supposed to work. And so for example, the brain takes foggy viewing conditions to be statistically correlated with imprecise or noisy visual signals. So in foggy viewing conditions, prediction error signals are attenuated and existing uh, prediction uh, predictions guide the brain's expectation about its environment. So um, now the prediction error minimization is the only fundamental cognitive kind uh, needed to explain all mental processes on this account. And so the, uh, actually I think I skipped a slide or I, at least I had one. Um, so there are basically two, I did skip a slide somewhere. Um, there are basically two kinds of uh, claims that the um, uh, predictive processing uh, theory makes. So, so one of them is that the prediction uh, error minimization is the only fundamental cognitive kind needed to explain all mental processes. And so the PP, uh, PP uh, framework says that uh, the perceptual system deals with the expected precision of the incoming signal by attributing gain to the signal in accordance with its expected precision. And the greater the expected precision of the signal, the greater the gain of the signal. So signals uh, expected to be low in precision don't play any significant role in the revision of predictions or models. Rather, the perceptual system relies almost entirely on its previous acquired information. So when the sensory signal is predicted to have a high prediction, the gain is high. Uh, and uh, the signal plays a significant role here. Uh, so in ordinary perception, the perceptual system is able to predict with fairly high reliability that a noisy signal. So the perceptual system is able to predict with uh, fairly high reliability that the noise signal has low precision, and that leads to attenuation of the signal's effect on the hypothesis de generation and revision. But uh, when we have, uh, when we deal with psychedelic experiences, um, uh, these kinds of experiences seem to present a counterexample to this idea of the predictive processing. Uh, and that's because psilocybin impairs the perceptual system's ability to reliably estimate the precision of incoming signals, as uh, the perceptual system is unable to reliably gauge the precision of incoming signals, and so it doesn't attenuate low precision signals as posited by this framework. So the signals that enter the sensory cortices as a result of the destabilization of the attentional engaging mechanisms in the thalamus are low precision or noisy signals, but the perceptual system fails to predict their low precision and therefore doesn't attenuate them. Uh, but despite not being attenuated, the randomly generated predictions are not updated in light of their failure to match the low precision signals. So the uh, low precision signal does not encode prediction errors in the way that the predictive process processing framework uh, seems to indicate. Uh, but uh, uh, Cartwright uh, uh, and uh, Frinston uh, argue that the uh, predictive processing framework is well equipped to provide a unified model for the brain mechanisms uh, underpinning psychedelic experiences caused by these hallucinogens that we've been talking about, including the synthetic ones and the naturally occurring LSD, psilocybin, mescaline, and so on. And so the principle of action of classic uh, psychedelics, they argue, is to relax the overall state of the brain. That's uh, evidence from the fact that they relax the prefrontal cortex, which occurs when the psychedelics, uh, when the psychedelics are bi binding to the serotonin 2A receptors. Uh, and that happens primarily in the highest levels of the brain's cortex and to a lesser extent to the lower levels of the cortex, uh, meaning the visual cortex. And so the relaxing of the overall, overall state of the brain results in low precision being assigned to prior beliefs. And so in the neurotypical brain, a brain that doesn't have any uh, psilocybin in it, prior beliefs of high precision suppress prediction error signals, thereby preventing these signals from revising our prior beliefs. And so Carthart and uh, Carthard, Harris, and Frinston argued that under the influence of psychedelics, uh, that situation happens where 
uh, the low precision information to our prior beliefs allows new information to revise these antecedent beliefs. Uh, and so to illustrate that the low precision assigned to our prior beliefs allows new information to revise those antecedent beliefs. So in other words, normally you'd have certain beliefs that the signal is not breathing, the, the, what you're seeing, the image in front of you is not breathing, but because the psilocybin is affecting your prefrontal cortex, now um, you, these beliefs are not going to be relevant to what you're experiencing, uh, your antecedent beliefs about how the world is, namely that objects don't actually breathe. And I added a picture up there just to give you an idea of how things are moving in normal vision. Our antecedent beliefs are different from the beliefs that, um, from what we're experiencing under psilocybin uh, or these other psychedelics. And so, uh, they ask us to consider a case where it appears that the walls of the living room are breathing. And so normally the prior belief that walls uh, don't breathe is assigned such a high probability that it effectively suppresses or constrains all prediction error signals suggesting otherwise. Uh, but because of the influence of psychedelics, this prior belief is assigned a very low precision, which means that it will no longer suppress or constrain these signals carrying the information that the wall is breathing. And so your brain is going to interpret the wall as breathing. Now, the problem with this framework is that when prior beliefs are uh, assigned a very low precision, they're essentially muted. But if that was the case, uh, the question becomes how are prediction error signals generate? Um, and so the, on this framework, the predict, predictive processing framework, uh, the prediction error signals originate in mismatches between high precision predictions and incoming sensory signals. But if the psychedelics lower the precision of prior beliefs, as um, Carhart uh, and uh, um, her colleagues are arguing uh, about the surroundings, then there are no high precision predictions to be matched to incoming sensory signals. So no prediction error signals can be generated in the first place. Uh, and in fact, given this framework, uh, given that this framework insists that the only bottom-up processes are prediction error signals, the lack of suitable uh, high precision uh, predictions seems to render the process by which psychedelic experiences arise very mysterious. So it doesn't actually explain much. In fact, it, it makes the whole experience far more uh, mysterious. And so we suggest that there's a better way, a better explanation for these kinds of phenomena, uh, because these kinds of phenomena, as we said, are very similar to ordinary phenomena in certain circumstances. And so uh, the suggestion that we make in this paper is that uh, uh, just uh, theory of perception is actually a better way to explain visual perception and psychedelic experiences. And so visual perception on this account uh, begins with the brain extracting the gist of an object or a scene. And so um, in the image on the slide, um, you see a little bit of uh, something. It's not clear what you're seeing, but uh, uh, A is a lamp, B is a flower, C is a vase, and you get enough information to make out something, but not all the information that you need. And so the visual, visual system extracts a great deal of information from just a single glance at a scene. So you can look at it really quickly and your mind is probably going to go to lamp when you see A, it's going to go to flower when you see B and so on. And so the object and scene gists uh, consist of these spatial low frequency information as we see on the image there. And the spatial low frequency information contained in object just includes information about the contour of the object and the, its surface pat pattern. So in A, you see a bit of a contour of the lamp um, <clears throat> and uh, the surface pattern. And the spatial low frequency information contained in the scene just includes information about object contours, object surface patterns, global scene out, layout, statistical scene regularities, uh, uh, and so on. And so for the uh, global scene layout, the image on the left here, um, you can make a lot about the room from the blurred image that is basically supposed to be a representation of the just uh, image. Uh, and um, it gives you enough information to basically make out what's in the room, uh, which is the picture on top. Uh, the same with uh, statistical scene regularities, like uh, 
Uh, you know, for example, that toilets are frequently found in bathrooms and so on. And these are things that you learn from past exposure to similar scenes. And so scene context can facilitate object uh, recognition. Uh, so the lamp would make more sense if it were on a table, for example, even though you just have the contour as, as opposed to, let's say, seeing it as a mushroom if it appeared in a forest. Uh, and so seeing a blurry image next to your nightstand here, another example is going to um, allow you to make out that it's a lamp and you can identify the uh, object because of the context that it's placed in. And so studies indicate that object and scene just are rapidly projected from the primary visual cortex to the orbit of frontal cortex in the prefrontal cortex via the uh, magnocellular uh, pathway. So basically the, the two cortexes in the back that relates to vision and the front that relates to thought uh, are connected in this kind of way. And the object scene just activate compatible uh, generic object or scene categories, such as object category of a table lamp or a scene category of a living room, just like in the images here. And so the spatial high frequency information contained in the visual signal is also processed more slowly in a partial bottom up fashion in the visual uh, perceptual stream, starting with uh, the visual cortex of V1 and ending in the inferior temporal cortex. And the lower regions of the visual perceptual pathway make uh, predictions about the low level features of the distal object. So for example, luminance contrasts, uh, texture and, and sharp uh, edges uh, by using well-defined low level visual processes such as double opponent processes to process the spatial high frequency information of the visual signal. And so the partially uh, processed uh, spatial high frequency information is matched with the activated object or scene uh, categories in the OFC. And that results in a categorization of the partial uh, processed visual information. And that categorized visual information is finally encoded as a perceptual representation in working memory. So now you start having the representations of the images. So how does this re uh, relate to psychedelic uh, experiences? Well, because uh, psilocybin disrupts the attentional and gating mechanisms in the thalamus, the influence of psilocybin results in um, uh, V1 extracting objects and scene just from a noisy or low precision visual signal and projecting them to the prefrontal cortex that's supposed to be doing the thinking. And so the higher the dose of psilocybin, the more noise is reflected in the object and scene gists. And in an attempt to make sense of the noise contained in the object and scene gists, the brain uh, tends to miscategorize some of the incoming visual information. <clears throat> and so these miscategorizations of the noise contained in the gists can result in a perceptual representation of familiar shapes being superimposed onto the visual scene. And those are, uh, uh, represent basically uh, experiences that people have of uh, psych when they're under the influence of psychedelics. And so a version of this phenomenon in normal vision is when the brain turns to an uh, undetermined stimulus into a familiar one. Uh, and uh, here we're talking about the phenomenon called uh, pareidolia. And so common examples of pareidolia include seeing faces or animals and things like clouds, rocks, or buildings. So you can look at the sky and see a cloud looking like an angel, for example, or you can look at a rock and it looks like a bear. And an image that we have here is uh, <clears throat> an image of a, a church that looks like a chicken's head. And... Um, uh, uh, those kinds of uh, cases result in uh, a normal vision under uh, normal conditions, uh, and, and those seem to resemble uh, the visual experiences we have when uh, people are uh, under the influence of psychedelics. And so at moderate doses of uh, psilocybin, the lower levels of noise may not make any noticeable difference to the objects and scene gists projected directly to from uh, uh, the uh, primary uh, visual cortex to the frontal uh, cortex, but low level visual processing is more meticulous and therefore uh, more in, in, in sensitive to uh, the noise. So in the presence of noise, the calculations of the edges or objects are made less precise than in ordinary circumstances. And because of the lack of precision, each new incoming signal will result in somewhat different calculations of the edges of the object. 
And so the image on the right uh, here again is supposed to be a simulation of uh, what the uh, scene looks like where the edges are a bit blurred. So, <clears throat> and because they're a bit blurred, also the edges of the objects uh, seem to be determined to be in different locations at different times. And the object looks like it's uh, contracting and expanding over time, which gives uh, the appearance of breathing. So um, during, uh, as, as the psychedelic brain determines the edge of the object to be in different locations at different times, the object looks blurry. And uh, uh, as a result, uh, we get these experiences of the object having actually movement or breathing. Uh, the uh, just perception can also provide an explanation for the enhancing effects of psychedelics on the appearance of colors. So a lot of the appearances uh, that we get or the visual effects that we get from psychedelics look something similar to the images here. Uh, super bright colors, kaleidoscopic images and so on. And that um, these kinds of appearances uh, relate to appearances of colors that look to have uh, more pure and more intense, uh, uh, that are supposed to be more pure and more intense than they would look otherwise. And so spatial high frequency information from the incoming visual signal is processed in the lower areas of the visual perceptual stream in a partially bottom-up fa fashion. And the lower visual processing results in the experience of color intensity or brightness or purity or saturation and hue. Uh, so the perceived brightness of an external surface is not only determined by the luminance of the surface, but also by the luminance of the surroundings. And so here in the image, again, you're not just honing into a specific object like a tree or the ferns or the other flowers, but the entire scene. And so the perceived brightness of an external surface uh, is the result of the pattern of activation of uh, V1 neurons, which are sensitive to the luminance of both the surface and its surroundings. And the experience of color purity and hue as separate dimensions of colors by contrast occurs further upstream, uh, presumably in the V4, V8 uh, color regions. But there's Evidence to suggest that the pattern of activation of V1 neurons in response to chromatic contrast uh, can affect the appearance of a purity of the surface color. So as we've said already, psilocin binding at, binding at level five pyramidal neurons in V1 results in this hyper excitation of local V1 neurons. And given the dominance of luminance and chromosensitive neurons in that area, uh, psilocin is likely to cause hyper excitation in the latter uh, types of neurons. And so the appearance of enhanced brightness and color purity of the external surface under psilocybin intoxication may be the result of this hyper excitation of luminance and chroma sensitive uh, neurons in V1. So the uh, just theory of perception is also compatible with findings that high doses of psilocybin impair endogenous attention, such as attentional tracking. Uh, and this is an image again, where the main areas that are affected uh, tend to be. Uh, uh, it doesn't show the uh, visual cortex, but you know, the, the other areas within the brain. Um, and again, this image is not one of the images we used. Uh, we just uh, used it just to give an idea of what these complex cortexes uh, or networks are supposed to be. And so uh, the available evidence suggests that psilocin distorts large scale prefrontal networks, which are listed on that image, uh, while simultaneously inhibiting the release of serotonin from RAFI neurons in the prefrontal cortex. And the distortion of these large scale prefrontal networks and the reduction uh, of the release of serotonin seems to contribute to the impairment of that uh, uh, relevant attention here, the endogenous attention. And so these uh, considerations uh, about how the brain is actually processing the information and what it needs to make sense of the stimuli uh, seem to indicate that this type of uh, theory of perception seems to be better equipped to deal with the uh, psychedelic experiences than the predictive processing uh, framework that has been proposed. And uh, we think there's much more work to be done in this area, but uh, basically uh, we should be looking in this direction a lot more than the direction of the predictive processing. And 
I know it was a lot of uh, jargon in this uh, talk, so we'll be happy to explain a lot of these things. And uh, apologies again, some of the slides got messed up. Uh, I think iCloud uh, uh, updated some of the different files that I had in different computers, and uh, I should have thought about that ahead of time. So thank you. No problem. Thank you so much. And that was a perfect timing. I, I didn't want to cut in there. Um, yeah, to let you know that, yeah, we were coming up uh, on about 50 minutes, but that's okay. That's perfect. Yeah, that was <clears throat> incredibly dense and incredibly informative. Um, very stimulating.